Uh, I would request the dignitaries on stage to come for the lighting of the lamp. Now may I please invite Professor Patricia O'Broy uh, to give the introduction. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really honored to be here to give the introduction to this uh, lecture and to uh, say something about the uh, speaker and also the chairperson and to begin with, the D.S. Borker Memorial Lecture and Mr. Borker himself. Uh, as possibly you've read, this lecture is in a memorial series on my vision of India 2047. It's particularly apt this year on the 70th anniversary of Indian independence. The lecture is a civil society initiative instituted in 1999 uh, and held every, every year since then. Uh, it was instituted by his sons, the late Jacob Bolker and Mr. Suhash Bolker, who is right here, and has had a, a real galaxy of speakers, chairs and discussants, among whom I'm happy to have seen my teachers, my colleagues, my students, and ever so many friends. This makes me very honored to be here. Uh, Mr. D.S. Borker, or D.S.B., as, or not, as he was known to his friends, was a civil servant, public sector administrator, and public sector administrator. He was known as a champion of the poor and the weak, and a man uh, with a human approach and utmost simplicity. He was born in Bombay in August, 17th August, so we're in August now, 1911, and he had his early education in Bombay and went on to England for his further studies. He, uh, Mr. Borger had varied interests, and one of the most interesting uh, for me as a former Australian was his interest in physical education. In 1940, at a relatively young age, under 30, I suppose, uh, he published a little book by Allen and Unwin in London called A Physical Education for India. This book is so rare that it's kept in the rarest section of the Bodleian Library of the University of Oxford, uh, from where his family recently sourced it. In this book, he makes an appeal for what he, uh, uh, for an innovative idea, what he called play streets, by which certain streets during specific hours of a day were to be closed down for vehicle traffic so as to enable children to play on the thoroughfares. Apparently, the experiment was some success in some cities in the UK. And not for children, but maybe for grown-ups as well. Perhaps we could say that Connaught Place on Sundays, I mean Rajiv <laughs> Chalk, <laughs> is, uh, uh, is taking on that role. Unfortunately, though, it's never taken off in India. Uh, DSB's professional career spanned a great range of positions. Uh, uh, on India's independence, he joined as the private secretary to N.V. Gudgil, a member of the Nehru's Union ca ca Cabinet. Uh, since we're, in, uh, we're remembering in the 70th anniversary of independence this year, we also remember the horrible events of partition. Uh, 
it, there, it is interesting to note that uh, during the riots in Delhi in 1947, DSB actually saved the life of Mr. Hussein Imam, chairman of the Council of States, from a mob which was trying to kill him. And at great risk to his own life, he escorted, uh, escorted him to, uh, the, uh, to the airport and out of immediate danger. This is a reminder of something that everyone has been thinking these days, that during these horrible events, many, many people owed their lives and their families' lives to the goodwill of people of the other community. This is exactly what he did. Later, he worked in, on the Planning Commission's project, a plan of projects in public sector organizations like Hindustan Steel, State Trading Corporation, Fertilizers Corporation, and so on. Now, the lecture, this series of lectures in his memory is intended to strengthen secular and democratic values and traditions and encourage the process of thinking of the kind of India we would like to see in 2047, a hundred years after independence. It's unique in a way that it has consistently showcased ideas and forward-looking agendas, and often what the, uh, the family have called contrarian ideas and agendas across a remarkable uh, spectrum. Uh, the, uh, as you will see from the list of the 18 persons of renown from various uh, uh, academic disciplines, who, various spheres of life, who've delivered this uh, uh, lecture in the past, there are many contrarians among them. Long may they live. And uh, plenty of argumentative Indians as well. Now we come to this lecture, the 19th in the series, uh, delivered by uh, Professor Bina Agarwal. Now, uh, Bina Agarwal has been my friend, my colleague, and for many people in women's studies, the women's movement, um, and, the, and feminist uh, circles around the global feminist circles, she has been a person to whom we have all looked up. She's Professor of Development, Economics and Environment at the Global Development Institute of the University of Manchester. And prior to this, she was Director and Professor of Economics at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi University, where she continues to be affiliated. It was in this capacity that I came to know her as a faculty member there for several years. She was educated in the universities of Cambridge and Delhi and has held distinguished research and teaching positions at many universities, including Harvard, Princeton, Michigan, Minnesota, New York University School of Law. She was the Harvard, Harvard's first Daniel uh, Ingalls visiting professor and later research fellow at the Ash Institute Kennedy School of Judgment, uh, Government. Now, uh, uh, Bina Agarwal's work covers both theory and empirical analysis. I think the f lecture to come will show you exactly that, with a particular focus on the most disadvantaged of members of the, uh, of the populace and on gender issues in particularly, particular. She writes especially from a perspective of political economy, but on a large number of interconnected fields, as you will just about, see, just about to see, including land rights, livelihoods, environmental governance, sustainable development, collective agriculture, agriculture, uh, te agriculture technology, and food security, as well as poverty and institutional transformation. Uh, she has uh, uh, particularly been a pioneer of work on gender, uh, uh, gender inequality in property and land, and her very well-known work, A Field of One's Own, Gender and Land Rights in South Asia, has been a, a landmark book in this field. It has gained many, many awards, uh, which I won't uh, detail. Her subsequent work extends this point of view to deal with gender and green governance, 
on, uh, where, on the impact of women's presence on forest governance and conservation, uh, demonstrating po uh, positive incomes on outcomes on both counts. What she calls the difference that women can make. In 2016, just a short while ago, Oxford University Press also published a three-volume compendium of her selected works entitled Gender Challenges. Uh, she's an original thinker as well as uh, engaged in policy advocacy and has uh, spearheaded, in 2005, spearheaded the campaign for the comprehensive amendment of the Hindu inheritance law to make it gender equal. I shall not go into detailing all the many, many, many awards that she has won, either for, both for her books and for her work and standing in all the areas I've mentioned. But simply rem remind you that she is a Padma Shiri for her contributions to education and uh, has recently been awarded an, uh, a special uh, order of agricultural merit by the government of France. Uh, so without further ado, I introduce you to Bina Agarwal. You have, uh, I've had the privilege of seeing her talk uh, uh, or a first peek and uh, know exactly what is in store. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Professor Upendra Bakshi, again with the caveat that there is no need to introduce him. He is so well known. Uh, he's Professor of Law since 1996 at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom and has been Vice-Chancellor of Delhi University for several years, 1990 to 94, and Professor of Law for 23 years uh, in the University of Delhi. He also was awarded the Padma Shiri by the Government of India. Uh, he's taught in many universities abroad, including the University of Sydney, uh, Duke University, New York uh, University School of Law, University of Toronto, and many others. He has a special interest in uh, his special interests in his teaching and in his research and writing include comparative constitutionalism, social theory, human rights, uh, corporate governments, business contact, and what he now likes to call, this is a mystery, the materiality of globalization. In fact, he is an all-rounder. But for many of us, he is famed for one particular intervention into public discourse and into policy making. Along with, and one wonders why the Google website doesn't mention this actually. Along with two other Delhi University professors, Professor Kaelka and Professor Lotika Sakar, as well as Professor Vasudha Dagamva, he was responsible for writing an, an open letter to the Chief Justice on what came to be called the Mathura rape case. It created enormous public debate. It fired the uh, developing women's movement and feminist discourse in India, and it forced the government to change the rape law. For this, he has been a hero for many, many years to all followers within the women's movement. And no better chair, chairperson could have been found for Bina's lecture uh, on this occasion. So with this, I uh, hand over to Professor Bakshi as chairperson and to Bina, Bina as speaker. Thank you. Professor Pindra Bakshi, Patricia Obroy, Suhash Burkar, the entire Mrs. Burkar, the entire Burkar family. I'm really honored to be <clears throat> asked to deliver the 19th Burkar Memorial Lecture, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I thank Patricia for a very warm and generous introduction to my work. Now, Mr. Dwarkanath Burkar was clearly a remarkable man, um, and one of the rare breed of civil servants we seldom see today. 
So I'm especially struck by this idea which Pat also talked about of converting some city streets into play streets for children um, for part of the day. Now, it also reminded me of my own late father, S.M. Agarwal, who was also a civil servant, although in the telecom sector, and he also loved sports. So, in fact, he organized Independent India's first All India Sports Meet in 1951 when he was 30 years old. So, Mr. Borkar and my father, both sports lovers, may even have met, or at least I would like to think so. Now, it is, uh, this is, um, it is not easy to envision. This is this grand topic um, of India in 2047, which is 100 years after India's independence. Now, I was born after 1947 and likely will pass away before 19, 2047. But to imagine what we would like India to be in 2047 and to make that happen, we need a vision today and work for its realization. So each of you will no doubt imagine that future differently. But I hope there is some congruence with the ideas I will share today, because clearly this has to be a project we'd all take forward jointly. I, um, I've paid particular attention to some of the pictures, so um, you might hear my voice and look at the slides. Now, 1947 was born out of extreme violence and social turmoil. Since then, we have had both peace and conflict. But if we want 2047 to be a, a year of peace and cooperation among people and communities, we will need an alternative vision and work to realize it. So what would I like? I would like to see a transformation of the four main institutions in which our economic, social, and political life is embedded. This is the family, the workplace, the community, and the state. Now, all four institutions as we experience them today are deeply unequal, socially and economically, often violent, and typically driven by self-interest rather than by other regardedness. Can these institutions become more equal, more just, more caring, more tolerant, more free? On so overarching a canvas, I can only make broad brushstrokes, leaving you to fill the details. And I will focus particularly on gender inequality intersecting with other inequalities such as class and caste. So you'll ask, well, why privilege gender? Because on the one hand, probing gender inequality reveals the most complex layers of injustices which are hidden within families and within society, layers which cut across caste, tribe, and religion. On the other hand, some of the most innovative efforts to transform institutions, especially rural institutions today, have emerged from a gender focus. So let's first consider the family. Now, most people think of families as altruistic, as caring, as the heart of the heartless world, quite unlike markets, which are seen as dominated by narrow self-interest. Now, in an idealized view of the family, I mean, you see that picture, I mean, it's, it's an idealized view of the family. Resources and tasks are assumed to be shared equitably, incomes pooled, preferences held in common, and decisions made jointly, or by an altruistic household head. So conflicts either do not surface or are resolved easily. Now, Gary Becker, who was the 1992 Nobel Laureate for Economics, formalized this idea in his unitary household model. Yet all of us know that this is not how real families behave. The preferences and interests of household members often diverge widely. And far from being equal, households are riven with gender inequalities. Now these inequalities are revealed most starkly in female adverse sex ratios, undermining a girl's basic right to life, even 70 years after independence. In fact, of course, the most adverse sex ratios are found in our most prosperous states, which is Haryana and Punjab. In 2011, Haryana had 877 females per 1,000 males. Kerala had more than 1,000. But even where the girl child survives, she typically faces worse outcomes than boys in nutrition, health, education, skills, and property access. 
So if you, you know, if you see just these, um, these, these images, you know, this, for instance, uh, the little girl is sitting, the boy is older, she's being, he's being fed. Moreover, 27% of girls are married before they are 18, and many become mothers before adulthood. Women and girls also work longer and, and the most onerous tasks, being mainly or even solely responsible for child care and elder care. So even if you take middle class, middle class homes, as, as many of us come from, and we sometimes have hired help, the responsibility to get these tasks done rests with women. Women are also greatly restricted in their mobility, both by social norms and by lack of safety in public places. But home is not necessarily a safe haven. There's a large number who experience spousal violence on a daily basis, and as life expectancy increases, they might also face elder abuse. So there's really rather little to suggest that families are spaces of pure altruism. Wouldn't you say that a more accurate depiction of family relations would be relations marked by both cooperation and conflict, driven by both altruism and self-interest, in which who gets what and who does what could depend on a person's relative bargaining power. Now, when you, when you mention the word bargaining, intra-household bargaining, um, in relation to a family, many people balk because it's contrary to their idea of an idealized view of the family. So let me emphasize that recognizing the importance of bargaining power within families does not imply that there is explicit bargaining over everything, although there may be over some issues. Bargaining power is often implicit, as in social norms that define domestic work as women's work, or in social perceptions that women's economic contributions are less and so they deserve less. Now such norms are often accepted as part of the natural order, or what the French sociologist Bourdieu called doxa, that which is admitted without argument or scrutiny. Such norms give men greater bargaining power even without explicitly having to bargain. So clearly Indian families need transforming. Can we change them so that their gender relations are marked by love and respect? by equal sharing of resources and domestic work, by women having a full say in decisions of the household, freedom of mobility, and most of all, freedom from domestic violence. Now of these many aspects that need changing, let me focus on two which, have, um, which both affect and reflect women's bargaining power within families. One is ownership of immovable property, and the other is sharing of care work. Now, women who own land or a house, you will agree, clearly have, are more economically secure. So for instance, agricultural land is a very important, perhaps the most important um, a source of livelihood for 65 to 70% of India's population, which is rural. But also we find that, of course, where mothers have assets, child survival, nutrition, and educational outcomes are significantly better. Most importantly, owning immovable property can protect them from domestic violence. So, you know, a colleague and I um, studied 500 randomly selected households in rural and urban Kerala. And Kerala is interesting because, as you know, Kerala is supposed to be the female-friendly state. And we found that spousal violence, the incidence was 49% if they had no house and land, 7% only if they had house and land. 18% if they had land, house, land only, and 10% if they had house only. Owning immovable property gives women an exit option which husbands recognize, and few want to lose a propertied spouse. Now, in contrast to this, many studies and ours finds that employment alone does not protect women. So you might say, well, you know, if a woman is employed, that's fine. But in fact, you, if you look at these figures, just imagine if a woman is in seasonal and irregular employment, and that is a vast majority of women in the informal sector, then she ends up, 49% of them end up facing physical violence. And what is also interesting is the wife is better employed than the husband, than 69%. So what it means is that simply being employed actually could put you more at risk of violence. And so this, this idea that, uh, which is not to say that 
employment isn't important, but the important thing is that employment is not enough. Um, now, in the 1940s, actually, I mean, if you see some of these, I fished out these pictures from all over. The most important demand by women's organizations, and many of these organizations, as you see, go pre-independence, who lobbied for education and the right to vote, but also particularly for equal rights in property. And it is precisely because ownership of property is so foundational for women's autonomy that there remains such a strong opposition to it. Now, during the 1951 Constituent Assembly debates, and there are some of you would be familiar with that, with that, legislators argued that giving women property would break up marriages. In fact, women may choose not to marry at all. So as one legislator said, may God save us from an army of unmarried women. So did it change? Well, 40 years later, many legislatures still held this view. So in 1989, the then Minister of Agriculture uh, said to me, and it was a planning commission seminar um, where there were 50 people and there were two ministers. So the agricultural minister said to me, after my presentation on women's rights and land, what do you women want to break up the family? So ironically, of course, unintendedly, these remarks imply that the entire edifice of marriage is based on gender inequality. And this edifice would crumble the moment women own property. Yet such fears are seldom expressed for women's employment. Why not? Because property does provide women, indep women independence in a way that simply having a job does not. So you'll ask, well, would marriages really get destabilized if women owned property? Possibly in their current form. But they would be recreated on more equal uh, on a more unequal basis and as happier places. So, can women achieve gender equality in property by 2047? Legally, of course, most Indian women, Hindus, Christians, Parsis, already have equal rights in immovable property as men. In 2005, the 1956 Hindu Succession Act was amended. I did play some part in that. And the amendment led to four major changes which could transform family, uh, family relations. First, it gives daughters equal rights as sons in agricultural land. And believe me, this agricultural land being such an important form of property had produced huge resistance um, even when the, uh, the Hindu Code Bill was being discussed. Secondly, women have equal rights by birth in co personary joint family property, which means that it is a right by birth and it cannot be willed away by fathers. Third, a married daughter, and this is remarkable, a married daughter can return and reside in the parental home. She can e e e even ask for partition and she can be a karta. And fourth, the amendments apply across India, superseding state level laws. Now this idea that a married woman today has a legal right to return to her parental home, to inherit land, and to manage joint family property is not a small idea. It is a transformational idea, especially in North India, where daughters are still married to strangers in distant villages. And they are seen as belonging to the husband's family and rarely welcomed back. Now this right of residence outside her marital home also provides a woman facing domestic violence an escape route. And this is something, of course, that can be exploited by the women's movement if, if, if they worked with the Domestic Violence Act and the Hindu Succession 2005 Act um, in, in, as, as complementary. Notwithstanding all of this, um, there are hurdles. So for instance, the whole business of legal reform still remains partial. Um, Muslim women and tribal women are still governed by unequal laws. Muslim women are governed by the 1937 Sharia Act, which remains unamended, and the latter, that is tribal women, by tribal laws which remain uncodified. Now in late 2005, I drafted a, a petition. You know, I'd been involved in the, in the amendment of the Hindu Succession Act, and once uh, that was passed by parliament on 29th August 2005 and then ratified by the president of India, uh, I thought, well, how about having a go at at least partially amending the, um, the, um, 
1937 Shariat Act. So I drafted a petition and a bill removing, for removing the discriminatory clause on land in the 1937 Shariat Act. It was signed by 420 persons and 46 organizations, including several hundred Muslim women and reformers, and strongly supported by the Muslim Personal Law Board. It got wide support since the amendment was still within the Sharia, and would make, but it would make a huge difference to uh, economic difference to women. Now I submitted this petition and bill personally to the then PM, but the PMO wrote back to me saying, I quote, it is the consistent policy of the central government not to interfere with the personal law of the country until the proposal comes from a sizable proportion of society. Now what sizable portion means is anybody's guess. Just five months earlier, the same central government had amended the Hindu Succession Act, a process which had been catalyzed by a similar petition. So clearly for an illusionary political risk, it's just an illusion, an opportunity was lost. That was 2005 and we are here 12 years later. Still I am hopeful that by 2047, with civil society pressure, these laws can be made gender equal. We may even have a, have a single gender equal civil code. Much more difficult is to bridge the gap between having a law and people accepting and practicing it. Now bridging this gap is really important because for instance, if you take something like land, 86% of arable land in India is privately owned. So the most important way of getting access to it is through the family, through inheritance. And although we lack All India data, individual studies indicate that only something like 10 to 15% of women in Northern India, 19% in Karnataka, about 39 to 40% in Kerala own any land. Now we know that social norms are a very important factor underlying this persistent inequality. So for instance, have you ever wondered why it is that some, a higher proportion of women in South India than North India inherit land? Why do you think? Well, interestingly, in South India, women can marry within their village, they can marry cross cousins, and there is no bar on parents taking financial help from married daughters. In fact, parents strategize where they might marry their daughter. Now, this reduces parental resistance to giving daughters property. In North India, women still marry strangers in distant villages, and social norms, as we know, forbid parents from taking a daughter's help. So here women are pressured to give up their shares. And I have some of these maps which I've created, um, I'd created them a while ago. They're still relevant um, to show how social norms can, can work. So this one is especially interesting. This was traditionally where the rights were, you know, if you looked at the map traditionally before um, amendments post-independence. But you, you can see that uh, this South Asia maps, but here's in, Eastern, uh, in Northeast and in Southern India, uh, the norms are that women can marry within uh, the village and they can, um, a cross cousin marriage looks very similar. It's a mixed picture in between and here it's all white, which is it's totally forbidden. And as you can see, you know, when we read about cup and chayats and you know, they're saying you're, you can't marry within your go through, you can't marry within your village, that's the area. So, so these, uh, the, these patterns make a big difference. Now, marriage norms, of course, are very difficult to change, but urbanization, smaller families could reduce parental resistance over time. But we also need that the government do a great deal more to ensure women's shares are registered. For instance, you know, that the woman just uh, is not pressured to write away her share in favor of brothers, that women get legal aid. And when the government transfers land to poor households, it is given in women's name. So there's a whole range of things and also providing subsidized credit for land purchase. Uh, this picture is about uh, women, some women who've got pattas from the government. Now the second key element in transforming families lies in, care, in sharing care work. Now what is care work? Care work is domestic tasks, child care, elder care. Uh, care work places huge burdens on women's time, especially in rural areas. So, you know, these are standard pictures. Moment you go out of Delhi, you, women carrying water, um, fodder, firewood, cooking in, in smoky kitchens, feeding animals. Now, all these tend to fall in women's domain. 
And I looked at a time use survey in 2000, which compared and looked at how many hours do men and women um, per week put into care work. Can you guess? Indian women spend 40 hours per week in care work, and men spend four hours a week. So this burden of domestic work, of course, we know, you know it affects women's mobility, it affects job options, and it starts at a really early age, and it continues through life. And believe me, rural women may not say much, but they deeply, deeply resent it. It comes out in their songs, but here is, here is a quote from village women in Punjab. We women stay at home and do backbreaking work, even if we are ill and pregnant. But we have no money of our own, so when the men come home, we have to cast our eyes down and bow our heads. So for Indian men to share equally in housework and childcare will require, as you, can, as you can see, a major change in social norms and attitudes. Even in Western countries, very few men share on a 50-50 basis. But studies do show that when they share, they find that it is pleasurable, and they say it makes their marriages stronger. So to Indian men who balk at the idea of doing domestic work, we need to ask, well, what kinds of families do you want? Are you happy in relationships based on dominance, even violence? Is there no joy in bringing up kids? Is it dignified to be always waited on by mothers, by sisters, by wives? Won't you rather have a spouse who's a friend than someone who fears you or lives with you out of compulsion? So, you know, I found this, um, <clears throat> there's more of care work. But, so I, <clears throat> there's this um, poem by Shelley, which was really evocative. Can man be free if woman be a slave? Well ye know what woman is. For none of woman born can choose but drain the bitter dregs of woe whichever from the oppressed to the oppressor flow. In other words, men's freedom is organically linked to that of women, and making families gender equal should, should thus concern not just women, but also men. So then let's look at a second major institution of which we are all a part, which is the workspace. <clears throat> now, most women, of course, work in the rural informal sector, but most, most of the younger women aspire to the formal sector. So what are these workspaces like, and how can we transform them? So here I, you, know, you can see there's a picture from rural India, there's a growing sector, the construction sector, and then you have the <coughs> IT. Now in the rural sector, let's consider the rural informal sector. Now, agriculture is the main source of livelihood for 79% of women workers relative to 56% of male workers. Most work on family farms as unpaid labor. Few have independent access to land or credit or inputs. Yet 35% of all farm workers are women. And this proportion is growing because you know, more men leave the villages and, uh, than women. But unless we address the resource constraints of women farmers, it will not only undermine their livelihoods, but also our food security. Then we are facing climate change, we are falling water tables, depleting soils, and we know every day we see in the newspaper, we talk about an agrarian crisis. So then we ask a question, well, is there a way out of it? Is there an alternative model to family farms? And I'd like to suggest there is. If we cooperated, farmers cooperated, and they pooled their resources. Now, you can cooperate at many levels. You can, for instance, you can do joint marketing. And I'm sure if I asked you, well, do you have an example of joint marketing, you'd all say, well, Amul, of course, is a wonderful example. So here's a picture of that wonderful example. You have Amul, 3.6 million members, mostly poor, and female owners, and so on. But joint marketing does not need much cooperation. You look after your animals, and you go and sell your produce. To overcome land, labor, and skill constraints, we need to have what I term fully integrated cooperation, involving pooling of resources for group farming. Now, this is, what does this mean? It actually means that suppose six of us have like quarter acre each, and then we pool it all together. We'll end up with, uh, with three acres. Um, so, or, or equivalent. Um, 
No, we'll, we'll end up with one and, one and a half acres. But let's, let's see. Uh, basically, it means that if you, if you pool all your land and you have small amounts, you'll have a larger farm. So, so you can imagine that if you have a larger farm, it, there'll be econ potential economies of scale. If you, if you pool your labor, there's labor sharing, and there could be labor saving. Uh, ac there could be greater access to credit, to inputs, and technical information. You would bring together diversity of skills because not everybody has leadership qualities or has the same amount of knowledge. And if you're a group, of course, you would have greater bargaining power with governments and markets. And you could, take me me you could have methods of adapting, with, um, adapting to climate change. Now, you would say, well, that's okay in theory. You know, we can, we can spell out, I'm sure if you sat down, you'd spell out three more uh, advantages. Can it be realized in practice? So to test this, I, I researched Kerala's group farming project, which began in the 2000s under its Kudum Shri program. And today, there are 62,000 <clears throat> 62, women's groups involving 2 lakh women farmers across all 14 districts of Kerala. What do they do? Women lease in land jointly, and they cultivate it collectively. Now, the idea came from village women, but the governance structure was carefully crafted by bureaucrats and civil society. So to see how they performed, I conducted a, a survey in 2012 to 14 to compare group and individual farms in two districts of Kerala, Alapi and Thrissur. And we collected weekly data for every input and output for 12 months. Now, each group had about five to seven members, and the members, interestingly, were heterogeneous. They came from all castes and religions. And they were jointly cultivating leased-in land. They pr were provided support, training, and so on from the Kudumshri mission. So what I did was I compared their productivity and their profits of group farms and individual farms. And this is what I got. And the individual farms are largely male-managed. Group farms had much higher annual product output per hectare than individual farms. And you can see the difference is, is, is very substantial. It's, they get an equivalent of 1.8 lakhs compared to 1 lakh of in, from individual farms. Most importantly, 80% of both sets, individual and group, uh, made a profit. But here you can see that the profit made by a, in, by a group farm was five times more than that made by an individual farm. And it is, so an individual farm was making 24,000, and here you have um, uh, five times more, 1.2 lakh. And one, one particular farm did extraordinarily well, 17 lakh. And this is just a group of five women. So these outcomes, or these types of outcomes, demonstrate that despite problems in leasing land and gender bias in access to inputs, group farms could succeed with initial state support and even outperform individual male farmers in high-value high, high value crops. So we have a win-win because it helps not just women but also families, and it also creates a pathway out of the agrarian crisis. In fact, after seeing the good performance of these um, women's groups, um, men's groups are also forming. Of course, uh, this is all subject to the possibility that there has to be state, state uh, support and and civil society support of the kind that you get in Kerala. But most young people, of course, don't want to farm. They want formal jobs. Only 14% of women work in the formal sector today. So we need serious government planning to create jobs for women in expanding sectors. And so far, we see rather little such planning. Also, there's a huge gender gap in earnings and they will remain if you have a double burden of housework and childcare. If women are the ones who always have to leave and interrupt work until the children are grown. Now, just to give you an idea, there aren't any figures for India, but just to give you an idea of how much difference that makes, you have figures for the UK. So there's a UK study which found that women still provide 75% of household uh, housework, and 27% of the gender wage gap is due to part-time or interrupted employment, and 29% due to discrimination. Now, the government, um, of course, wants to give Indian men, you've heard of this, right, in the government sector, 15 days of paternity leave. But this barely uh, scrapes the surface of the problem. Because really, if spouses are to share equally in childcare without career costs, we need a radical reorganization of work itself. 
I mean, you would say, well, we really need both spouses to have flexi work time and be flexi in, in location, the possibility of leaving and re-entering the job market. Only then would men and women both have more complete lives, merging work and family life. So is this pure fantasy? In fact, not, because there are many companies globally who now offer this work-life balance. Now, Australia, for instance, the largest telecom uh, company in Australia, Telstra, has all roles flex, where people can choose their location of work, their work schedule, and in fact, absenteeism, instead of increasing, has actually gone down by 17%. And you have to, you know, increasing companies in Japan, in the US, and so on, who are now beginning to offer flexi time. Of course, we still have to see whether, if men will choose this as much as women. So, it's, some of you may have recognized this as the Raymond suiting clip. Now, it's interesting, not only because, as you can see, the husband stays back to child mind while his wife goes to her corporate meeting, but also because it shows that even with corporate jobs and nannies, childcare does not vanish. But most women, of course, don't travel to work in cars and they don't have corporate jobs. So most of them travel in buses and metros to standard jobs and they face sexual harassment en route and in the workplace. Now we have a lot of strong laws, but most women don't report harassment for fear of losing their jobs. And, as, and it's getting worse. I mean, just 10 years ago, I remember I could drive, drive back late from the university without feeling unsafe. And today, stalking becomes a daily occurrence. I mean, this chilling incident in Chandigarh is not an isolated one. So are these young men who stalk women India's youth dividend? And what about the dividend young women can bring? I mean, can, and can we as a nation have so many talented women stay home due to lack of safe jobs and social norms as some of our politicians seem to suggest? I'll leave you with that question. The third important space that I'm talking about institution is the community. Now, what is a community? Now, many of you think of community as local geographies, the, a village, a hamlet, a resident welfare association, but a community can also be of kin, your relatives, of a caste group, of religion, of professionals, and most of us really simultaneously belong to many communities. But often the communities we say we belong to is what Benedict Anderson termed imagined communities. They're constituted of people we may never meet face to face, but with whom we imagine an affinity. And this is especially the case with caste and religion. Now, in the 1947 partition riots, in the 1984 Sikh riots, in the 2002 Gujarat riots, in the 2013 Muzaffar Nagar riots, we saw people attacking their own neighbors for the sake of imagined affinities to religion and caste. Communities can be homogeneous or heterogeneous, destructive or constructive, cooperative or conflictual. And today we are seeing two different scenarios unfolding. One is of conflict and the other of cooperation. So at one level you'll say, well, everywhere we look, we see communities in conflict across caste, religion and gender lines. Our guardians of law, the police often stand by and they watch. We see bystanders even filming the violence instead of helping the victim. We do not help victims of accidents. We do not help people being beaten to death. We do not help women being molested. We do not speak up if our elderly neighbor is abused by his children. There was a survey by HelpAge which found, I mean, just imagine, that 92% of respondents in Delhi said they would not act against elder abuse. So what have we become 70 years after independence? Where is our humanity? No, as Methli Sharan Gupt said in his poem, and I've added to, to the la second line, Hum kaun hain, kya ho gaye hain? Kahan ja rahe the, kyon bhatak gaye hain? The first line is the poet's, the second is mine. And clearly there are no easy answers. What I find striking, though, is that in situations of mutual interdependence, we do cooperate. 
and the picture isn't that dark. But all these examples of community cooperation that I have come across come from rural India, <clears throat> and they relate to rural institutions. And interestingly, all of them, in all of them, including women, makes a key difference. So I'm going to share with you some positive examples from the rural context of communities cooperating, and then ask, why are we not doing more of that? So take forests. Now, you know, one in six persons globally and millions in India depend on forests for firewood, for fodder, for food items. And in 1990, after long years of government failure to protect forests, India took a great leap of trust and decided to collaborate with local communities to protect our forests. So it, joined, it launched this joint forest management program where it gave over large tracts of degraded forest land to local communities to manage. Now, villagers who, had, who were earlier seen as destroyers were recognized as protectors of this very valuable natural resource. And Nepal did the same three years later. Now, in 1998-99, I traveled across seven states of India and parts of Nepal for six months. I just wanted to see what was happening across the country. And I saw some remarkable cases of restored forests of communities cooperating. By early 2000s, India had 84,000 community forestry groups protecting 22% of, of our recorded forest area. And Nepal had done the same. Now, almost everywhere, there was green growth where earlier we could barely see the rootstock. And national figures reflected it. So if you look at the figures for um, uh, uh, forest uh, cover in 1990 and compare it to 2001, India's forest cover increased by 3.6 million hectares where earlier it was declining rapidly. But I also found that these groups were constituted almost entirely of men whether it was a general body which had to have all members of the village community or executive committees, which were the core decision-making unit. So I asked myself, well, would women's involvement in forest management make a difference? And I decided to test this out. Now, so there was no data, ready-made data, so I undertook an in-depth primary survey of 135 groups in parts of India and Nepal. And given that the executive committee was the main decision-making unit, my sample was based on a selection of executive committee's gender composition, and they often had mixed castes. So what did I find? I found, so this is, this is just to show you a slide of what it was, where, you know, in most cases, was uh, two women. But, um, but then uh, when, I, when I looked at cases where women were included, what I found was that where the groups had a critical mass of 25 to 33% women, not only did women participate more in decision making, but there was significantly greater likelihood of improving than in groups with few or no women. And I, just to give you, in the case of Gujarat, we found that um, a high, groups with a high percent of women did very much better. And if you included landless women, now, most people will say, well, landless women would typically have a lot of interest in, in going in and breaking the rules for firewood. But in fact, if you included them in management, the likelihood of the forest improvement was 75% greater. And then I looked at Nepal and where all women's groups had, they had 51% greater likelihood of improving forest canopy than groups uh, with men. And this is despite getting smaller and worse um, forests. So what explains these results? Well, there were two things in particular. One was that bringing in, if you bring in half the population, which is also using the forest and predominantly using the forest, it improves protection. So as one, uh, this is a, they started protecting it better. So this is a patrol um, of, of women. And uh, they not only started protecting it themselves, but they also involved other women to do so. And secondly, you know, women and men have different bodies of knowledge about the local ecology. And, and women brought their knowledge to bear uh, for forest regeneration. So community cooperation, inclusive of women, helped protect a major resource, which is so important both for livelihoods and for mitigating climate change. Then take water, I mean, take water. You know, community management of tank irrigation goes back to the 16th century in South India. And canal irrigation goes back at least to the mid-19th century in North India. You know, the British set up this Varabandi system. Vara means turn, bandi means fixed, and this is a board where each farmer got water in turn at a fixed time and date. And this system continues. 
In fact, most states where, which have canals and, and water systems have some sort of community cooperation. We also have what you call, do you remember, some of you might remember this Pani Panchayats, Water Users Associations. They were started, um, for instance, in Maharashtra, they were started in the 1970s by Vilas Rao uh, Sulanke. Uh, to regulate water use. And for the first time, landless farmers were also given rights in water. And today, many states have these associations. Then there is a third example, which we're all familiar with, of community cooperation, which is self-help groups. But federations of self-help groups. So India today has 8.6 million SHGs, of which 85% are of women although there's no gender bar in forming SHGs. And they are saving and thrift groups, but they, ha they have been scaled up to form federations. Can you guess how, what, how many thousand federations? There are 69,000 SHG federations, mostly in South India, at village, panchayat, district level, and also in Andhra as a state level. Now, what's striking about these is, you will say, well, these women are, are, are saving and thrift uh, groups, but they have become much more than that because the federations, in fact, in, there was a study of 7,000 villages in Andhra Pradesh, which found that the federations were buying food grains and necessities in bulk, so that they could get it at a cheaper rate. And then they were extending that to poor families who, didn't, who weren't able to earn enough, so that they, they could at a, at a minimal cost price, and sometimes even as a loan. So what, what this demonstrates, demonstrates is that you can have heterogeneous communities across caste and religion, they can cooperate out of enlightened self-interest and interdependence. Of course, some of these systems could be eroding and we need to strengthen them. So my question was then, can we in cities learn from these rural examples and extend cooperation to new social problems, such as care for the elderly? Now take, take our city, uh, Delhi. Now here's a, here's a picture. Um, there could be other pictures. So on the one hand, we have a young population. On the other hand, we have an aging population. Both need caring. And women and families spend a lot of time doing so. But we know that families are changing. Many elders are living alone. Their children work in other cities. So can we create new types of communities which adapt to changing family forms and provide mutual support services? Can communities share Child, child care, youth care, and elder care. You know, we can learn from other countries because, for instance, in the USA, there are many organizations where people volunteer time for community service. But I've also seen networks where teenagers take responsibility for older people, and they help them shop, they keep them company to beat isolation, and so on. And most notably, many older people don't need such help. I mean, it's not like you retire 65 and suddenly you become um, you know, uh, disabled. Of course not. So you have lots of older people who are physically active, who are intellectually curious, who are knowledgeable, and they could provide company and a learning experience to teenagers whose parents are in full-time jobs. So basically, as I see it, every community could create a network of volunteers among both the youth and the elderly, and this could transform communities. It would be interesting to, to, to discuss this further. So today we have, we are at a crossroad. We are facing two different scenarios. One of communities that are in conflict and easily mobilized into violence against neighbors based on imagined affinities of caste and religion and vulnerable to political manipulation. And this reflects the fragility of our communities. But the other scenarios of communities where people are cooperating across social difference to protect our common pool resources, even supporting the elderly. I do believe that unless we take the second part to 2047, there will be no community left for the name. No nation can prosper without peace between communities. Finally, consider the state. So, um, you know, the state is, as we know, state, government, it's the most complex, the most powerful of institutions. It's many arms, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, enter all the arenas that we're talking about. They affect the family, they affect the workplace, they affect the community. The state has the power to transform them or to undermine them. 
So for instance, if you take again gender as an example, the state could reform inheritance laws to make them gender equal. It could provide legal aid to women wanting to claim family property. It could transfer land to the poor and to poor women for farming and homesteads. It could create jobs. It could provide safety. Now, all these steps could increase the bargaining power of women and the poor in multiple arenas. Or the state can, can fail to do all of the above. So I'm sharing with you um, uh, 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 two lines from a poem by, by um, the older Bachchan, and he alerts us to this danger. Utre in aakhon ke aage jo har chameli ne pehne, veh chheen raha dekho mali, sukumar lataon ke gehne. Look, the gardener is himself destroying the garden. So I see these evocative lines as a caution that all those that we think as our protectors, our families, our neighbors, our employers, most of all the state, can become assailants unless we transform these institutions to regain our common humanity. Notably, the state is not a monolith. It too is an arena of cooperation and conflict between parties with varying degrees of commitment to equality and social justice. Now, in which direction the state moves can depend on many factors. But in my view, the following would be especially important. So let's say, here's the state. And you can see what it, what it says, that democracy is also the freedom to elect dictators. So what do we need? One is strong opposition parties which could provide checks and alternative visions and paths to development, something I think we are quite deficit of. Deficit of uh, we have a deficit of at present. An independent judiciary which can protect citizens' rights against an overarching state, and I believe we have a fairly independent judiciary, recent um, judgments included. Then, very difficult and independent non-corrupt bureaucracy which implements policy and can resist political pressure. So if you think of Mr. Borker's time, you know, if you think of just after independence, the civil service was like that. I'm not sure that we've done all that well in recent decades. Then we have the media. Now potentially, of course, the media can be a voice of people and the voice of conscience in interrogating the state. Some elements of the media can serve this function, but others today are not. So for instance, um, as we know, a typical discussion on TV has representatives from major political parties who drown out the voice of the one uh, token non-party expert. So each channel, as we know, sounds more chaotic, more loud than our parliament. And like our parliament, there is a notable absence of women as serious economic and political commentators. So my question to the media is, do all sides have moral equivalence? It's a question which the American public is also asking today. If the media is to be a voice of the disadvantaged, shouldn't it be privileging their voices and the voices of non-partisan experts and civil society? Without the mandatory loud presence of political spokespersons on every panel. So if you're friends in the media, you could convey this. The fifth significant element is, of course, intra-party democracy, the freedom to be critical of one's own party and its agenda. Now, it's striking that in the US today, so many Republicans are speaking out against the statements of their own Republican, pre Republican president. Now, in India, towing the party line is considered a virtue. So transforming the state requires that you know, I, at least this is what I feel, is that the elected representatives have to have their own moral compass and stand by it when needed beyond party diktat. But the most important external check is, of course, civil society, all of us here. What can we do? Well, for a start, we can hold our representatives accountable for the social policies they promised. We also need to know what do they stand for? You know, there's a long-standing demand, as you know, for reservation of one-third seats of women in parliament. But will the women so elected speak up for women's, women's rights? Now, Shirin Rai, a political scientist from Warwick University, where uh, Upendra Bakshi is also based, uh, she interviewed 
many Indian women legislators, and she found that none saw herself, none saw herself as representing women's interests. Typically, they felt that they were bound by the party's agendas. So does this mean there's little point in electing women to power? Of course not. But we do need more than simply having a woman in office to further women's interests. And we can say the same for Dalit and minority candidates. What do people stand for? Most of all, I'm sure you would agree, we need a state committing to upholding our constitution's four basic principles. Justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, these are all principles we cherish, and they're worth fighting for. But there's a great chasm between believing in these principles and realizing them. And the state will not automatically help us do so. I believe we also have responsibility as citizens to help realize them. So the question is, can we build a national consensus such that the four constitutional principles become the touchstone of state performance, which no political party can elite? The power of movements, of protests, of insisting you can't do this, not in my name, all this matters in every decade, but perhaps more today than ever before. So I have argued that in my vision of India 2047, I would like to see a transformation of our four major institutions, the family, the, the workplace, the community, and the state. And we've talked of every institution separately but each is deeply connected to the other. So if you have families in which care work is shared, it will increase work options for all members. You have a workplace which is flexible, it will create stronger families and communities. Communities which cooperate across difference and reach out to those in need will prosper. And a state which upholds its constitutional guarantees will strengthen all other institutions and the country. In fact, only then should they be worthy of our vote. So let me end um, on a personal note. So when I think back over the past few decades, I feel that among the most vibrant periods, barring short uh, reversals, were the 1980s and early 1990s. And that was when social movements found strength. The women's movement, the environment movement, movements for civil liberties and democratic rights. The voice of civil society could be heard loud and clear and could be raised without fear. Also, you know, as a woman, you could ride home after midnight without being stalked. As, as a free-thinking person, you could speak out without being trolled. So we were economically poor as a nation, but we felt a sense of hope. So to, tran to transform 2047, I believe we need a resurgence of that vibrancy and that hope. And again, I found two lines from Bachchan's another poem. लहरों से डरकर नया पार नहीं होती कोशिश करने वालों की हार नहीं होती so I, to conclude i a friend of mine suggested she's sitting here that i should end my talk with an inspiring image so i chose an unusual one and i chose the image of my favorite galaxy which is andromeda now this galaxy is 2.5 million light years away just imagine when the light that we observed on Earth from Andromeda left the galaxy, there were no humans on Earth. By the time the light reached us, you could see it, we had a flourishing civilization. Thank you. <laughs>